Hello, I'm Christopher Springman, and you're listening to Neff Talk, a podcast series created with nephrologists in mind from Satellite Healthcare, a not-for-profit dialysis provider that leads the industry in home therapies while supporting clinical research. How would you define an act of love? What about donating a kidney to a person you deeply care about, one who is a dialysis patient? I believe this is one of the great acts of human kindness, one that brings empathy to a whole new level. Our guest today, Dr. Vanessa Grubbs, MD, a nephrologist, gave her heart and a kidney to her boyfriend, Robert, who is now her husband. It's all documented in her very candid book, Hundreds of Interlaced Fingers, which is a love story, yes, but one with very useful information about kidneys and kidney disease, too. (laughs) Thank you for joining us today on Neff Talk, Dr. Grubbs. Thank you so much for having me. Dr. Grubbs, you are celebrating two anniversaries shortly. Mm -hmm. Marriage to your husband, Robert. Congratulations. Yes. And the anniversary of a very special gift to him while you were dating. One of your kidneys, which just (laughs) may have extended his life. I, I think so, yeah. Can you tell me about that, please? Yeah, so we're coming up on our 13th transplant anniversary, and um, he had been on dialysis for um, maybe five years or so when we met, and I was a primary care doctor at the time, and it was really through that experience of watching him um, be on dialysis and what it's like for a person living with a serious illness in a way that I unfortunately didn't really pick up as a doctor, that really inspired me to um, decide to donate to him in and, and large part because the, the transplant system um, didn't really seem like it was going to come through for him uh, in, in time. On your second date with Robert, you asked to see his fistula, his yeah. dialysis access. <laughs> was that before dessert? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we were uh, just starting out. We were uh, meeting for drinks and hadn't had dinner yet. And he was uh, very eager to show it to me um, as most of his um, uh, relationships, if you will, ended with the second date. Um, and once uh, women uh, saw what was um, what he was going through, or mostly he just had a lot of first dates. So for me, it was really important to see his fistula because my only real experience with dialysis patients were those who were in the hospital and they were always in trouble because of their access. And um, and I learned that when we don't have the access, we don't have when we don't have a way to connect people to the dialysis machine, then they they die. They um, they don't live very long. And so when I was making the decision to get involved with Robert, it was really important to me to know that he had a healthy access. If I was going to uh, risk investing my heart into this person, I wanted to at least have some small assurances that he was going to be around for a while. Your decision to donate a kidney to Robert prompted some skepticism, to say the least, on the part of your friends. Mm -hmm. One of whom said to you, girl, you don't even have a (laughs) ring yet, as if an engagement ring would be an appropriate down payment on one of your kidneys. (laughs) This was a colleague. That was my interpretation of what she did say. Uh, Uh, What she said was that, you know, I do this in a heartbeat for my partner, but we've been together for 10 years. So that my interpretation of that was, um, you sure you want to do this? This guy is your boyfriend. And. You well, know, that so, is a big step, yeah. to say the least. At the time, I, I really didn't see it that way. I, I saw it as I uh, have this person whom I love very much, and he needs a healthy kidney, and I have two of them. So, of course, I'll give him one. Uh, and that was really all it was uh, to me. And and it didn't seem like that huge of a deal. But, of course, um, you know, after the fact and how everyone responds to it, I, I realize that for most people it is it is a, a really big deal, but uh, I definitely would do the same if I had an opportunity to go back. You document with great passion and love the actual transplant dual surgeries. 
as your Thank kidney you. is removed, placed in a bowl of ice water, and rushed down the hall to Robert, just like that. That is a very thrilling mm. part of the book. Thank you. You know, that came about uh, pretty in an interesting way because I originally planned to uh, just write about the surgeries, what happens in the surgeries. And then I decided, well, you know, I've never actually seen a transplant surgery, um, even in medical school. So I uh, just called up the uh, surgeon who took my kidney and asked him if I could observe. And he was very gracious and um, invited me into his operating room. And I think that I was really awed by what, uh, you know, I already had a, a lot of respect for our surgeons, but just to see how they can uh, do this work uh, laparoscopically, like with just operating uh, little spike type instruments and watching a, a monitor, I, you know, my admiration grew uh, even further. But um, it that that experience allowed me to write about those surgeries in a very different way. So I'm I'm really appreciative of that. You said in the book, hundreds of interlaced fingers, that Robert had your kidney and your heart, but despite the fact that Robert's new kidney, your kidney was working, and in fact, you saw the bag of fresh yellow pea <laughs> hanging off his bed, there were scary post-surgery complications, weren't there? Yeah, there were, and I I don't know where I had this uh, supreme level of confidence because I'm, I'm not usually that uh, confident in my day-to-day, -day, but I knew that the kidney was fine, and that uh, everything would be fine, um, even through the complications, and that it was a problem more with the plumbing. He went through a lot. It was um, a long hospitalization for him. It was uh, uh, 10 days when usually it's five for the recipient. And In fact, at one point, Robert seemed, in reading the book, very demoralized and frustrated that you know it was all for naught. What a waste. Seemed like he was almost tempted to give up, but of course he didn't. The way Robert has described things to me is that dealing with the day-to-day -day of dialysis was what he had to set his mind to. He couldn't really think about hoping for something else because that would that was hard. It just made it harder when things didn't happen that you were hoping for, and he had no idea how long the day-to-day -day of dialysis would last for him. And so I think... Uh, for me to come forward as a donor and actually go through the entire process and uh, uh, have the surgery scheduled, that's when he allowed himself to hope a little bit, to actually believe that, okay, maybe this will all work out. And, and it's as if he was just kind of kicked in the gut um, as a you know repayment for allowing himself to hope a bit in the face of things going so poorly at first. So um, I think it was just so emotionally overwhelming for him, particularly as a person who is fairly stoic in general, but th then uh, going through years of um, dealing with this serious illness only to see the kind of light at the end of tunnel get uh, seemingly put out. I can imagine that your patients are probably overwhelmed at times, or often, with the prospect of dialysis. I'm sure. Yes, yes. Do you ever tell them this story about Robert to indicate to people that you've, you've kind of been there and done that, and, and you have at least some sense of what they might be going through at this point? Yes, sure. I'm very open with um, patients and their families about my experience. And uh, mainly in the sense of helping patients become more comfortable with the notion of accepting a living donor. Uh, most patients uh, tr seem to reject that notion out of hand because, like Robert, they don't want to put anyone that they love in harm's way. But in truth, from the donor's perspective, if it's something that you want to do, it, it, there there is no amount of risk that makes it uh, something that would make you change your mind. At least that's the way it, it was for me and um, other donors that I speak with. We're willing to take on a lot more risk than our um, recipient loved ones are willing to allow us to. So um, I do definitely share um, 
our story often and in some ways too to build a, a level of um, rapport and trust with patients and 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 as you said it, it does um, give a, a sense of oh um, I have a, a deeper experience and I understand a bit better than probably most doctors what they're going through. I understand that part of your motivation for changing specialties, especially as an African American physician, was your increased awareness of healthcare disparities among people of color in the dialysis and kidney donor communities. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, uh, I was a, a primary care physician. Uh, at the time that I started dating Robert, and um, I really wasn't aware of uh, the details that were going on within the nephrology world, and and that's just the way it goes. If you're not a part of these um, kind of inner circles and walkabouts, you you don't really know the the actuality of what happens there. So um, it really was my involvement with Robert that I learned a lot about. Um, what was happening inside the world from that perspective, at least. And, you know, I trained at a, um, a public hospital in Oakland, California, and I was certainly aware of the part of we being very much encouraged to um, get permission from families to allow the um, people to become a donor after they passed. But I never heard of anybody actually being referred to receive a, a transplant when I went with him for his transplant evaluation, it just allowed me a more um, insider view of what the transplant system is really like. And to me, it just felt very much stacked against um, people of color. In fact, you wrote an article about people of color and transplantation entitled, Good for Harvest, Bad for Planting. Tell us about that. Yes. When I wrote that particular essay, they allowed me to do my artist type of um, uh, title. But really, it was about uh, my experience in terms of training at a public hospital and then going through the process of of trying to um, get a deceased donor kidney transplant with Robert. I spent a lot of my time doing clinical research and write lots of scientific articles for medical journals. But it was that narrative essay that I was really particularly proud of because I felt that one, it would reach a, a lot more people and, and give more of an insider view of what the transplant system was like. And, and it did. It, it spoke to a lot of people and, and went um, kind of viral, so to speak. And, but that piece also got me in a bit of trouble. Ooh. I was pretty naive about it <laughs> in, in the sense that I thought, oh, the transplant community would receive this piece as, oh, this is someone who is a physician and this is the way she perceived the transplant system as well. So maybe we should reflect a bit on how we can improve um, our perception and our and uh, everyone's access to transplant. But instead, they, they um, took it quite personally and were very defensive about it. And, um, and not that most people said anything to me personally, but it wasn't until I was trying to get a job at the end of my nephrology fellowship that I learned that... Uh, It came back to haunt you. Yeah, that people were not happy with me. Hmm. But my whole decision to go into nephrology as a specialty was really so that I could um, do something for um, everyone else. For, For Robert, my way to solve the problem was to give him a kidney. But for everyone else, I, I wanted to um, do research into why we had these disparities in um, who gets a kidney and what we could do about them. Could you give me and our audience an example of the disparities in terms of donation and who, according to race, gets what? In, in this country, blacks make up about a third of the kidney transplant wait list, but receive, particularly at the time, roughly 20% of the kidney transplants, while whites made up a, a third of the transplant wait list, but received roughly half of the donated kidneys. A lot of people have um, asserted various reasons for this, and, and there have been um, some steps um, in progress made since that time. For example, there was um, a a seminal study published, I want to say, in the 
um, early 90s, which showed that um, in every step in the process towards getting a transplant, blacks were much um, less likely to get through that step. So in uh, December 2014, a new rule went into effect that said you get credit for your time on dialysis. And so that's that's really a wonderful thing. However, I don't think it goes far enough because people can be um, accruing time on the wait list, which is still one of the most important factors long before they start dialysis. And so that brings up all the issues of who has access to care, Ah. who is aware that they have kidney disease in the first place, who has access to specialists, and that nephrologists are the only people who can refer patients for kidney transplant evaluation. So there's all these system-level pieces that interfere with people having equitable access to kidney transplant. So I think there's a lot more that we can do to make sure that everybody has an equal shot. I was very touched by your observation that I don't know anyone who goes into medicine to give bad news and upset people on a daily basis, yet many of us end up making people cry. That's what we do for a living. How do you deal with that? It is tough. We all go into medicine with kind of this wide-eyed eagerness to improve the world and help people and all of this. But the reality, at least in nephrology, is that there is a lot of giving bad news. But at the same time, it, it is really important to me to um, take care of patients with advanced kidney disease because I do think it takes a level of empathy and willingness to um, be with a person while they're going through mm. Um, you know, learning about and coming to terms with such a serious illness, particularly when um, most people feel pretty well until there's almost no kidney function at all. Your book, Hundreds of Interlaced Fingers, has been described as a love story, love for a man, love for the profession of medicine, love for humanity, and love for life. On that happy note, would you please read Robert's, well, Let's call it what it is, love letter to you. (laughs) A very nice thank you and acknowledgement for what you did for him, giving him what turned out to be the gift of life. Yes. So um, this is um, included in the book, and I I came across it while I was just trying to gather more details to include. And Robert, um, you know, he's a he's a kind of burly guy. He played football at a college level. He, you know, he can be pretty stoic, but um, on paper, he can be so incredibly romantic. And so this is an example of that a letter that I came across um, a little over a month after our transplant surgeries. And it read, Vanessa, I know that neither one of us had in mind a year ago that we would meet someone and fall in love, but it has happened. And for that, I have no regrets. In fact, it is one of the best things that happened to me in years. For this and what has happened to us and between us, I have you to thank. For the past year, you have brought so much joy to me that words can never explain. In the past year, you have brought so much life back into a lifeless body. I know and realize what it is to love and to feel loved. You have so enriched my life. I always feel so overwhelmingly in your debt if there can be accounts in love. What it has been to me to live this time in your heart and companionship, no phrases can convey. Much, much love, Robert. That's very sweet. Yeah, Yeah, he he has his moments. (laughs) (laughs) And part of you is a part of Robert forever. How does that feel? Well... I'm just really happy that I could do this for him. I really felt that this gift was something that would allow him to be on the planet longer and in a much better quality of life. And to me, that is my reward. The subtitle of the book, by the way, is A Kidney Doctor's Search for the Perfect Match. I think you found the perfect match in Robert and he and you. (laughs) Happy anniversaries, Dr. Grubbs. Thank you so much for joining us today on Neftalk. It's been an absolute joy. Thank you. I really appreciate it.